So I'm going to talk about two components of integrated pest management that we've been doing research on in Maynooth. Uh, and this is a biological control using nematodes that Roger mentioned already. Uh, so I'll give you a bit of uh, um, our experience with that. And the second is uh, forecasting the timing of weevil emergence. Uh, so it's not numbers, but just the timing of weevil emergence. And this is something that we've been doing as part of the PWIPM project that this uh, is uh, just, just coming to an end now. Okay, so nematodes, uh, they're amongst my favorite animals. Uh, here we see the little um, juvenile stage that are the ones that are applied against pests. And uh, so they're a sort of a long lived stage um, and they uh, actively move looking for insects to kill. Now they don't, uh, they, they kill with the help of their uh, bacteria that they carry in their guts. So they can actually kill an insect within uh, two days, if conditions are favorable. Um, and then the bacteria take over. Um, so these nematodes, although they're little animals, they can be produced commercially in enormous bioreactors of hundreds of liters uh, with billions of nematodes inside. Uh, and then they can be uh, packaged, uh, shipped, and uh, used against various pests. So they're used worldwide. In Ireland, they're used against a vine weevil, a pest of ornamentals and soft fruits, uh, and also against uh, pests in mushrooms, though I'm sure the mushroom growers don't like it to be mentioned that they have uh, pests. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, the idea in using nematodes against pine weevil, as Roger mentioned, is that they're applied to the stumps or around the stumps. The idea being that they will move, they're actively moving down into the stump where they, uh, and into the, the, through the soil and into the stump where they parasitize uh, the weevil larvae or pupae. Uh, and that reduces the number of weevil adults that are ready to emerge. So it's kind of indirect plant, pro plant protection, if you like. Uh, they're uh, reducing the numbers. Uh, they're not directly protecting the plant. Um, so we've done various trials over the years uh, that we've uh, assessed in two ways. One by using stump hacking, uh, where we remove the bark and the soil from around a stump, and then we can actually uh, quantify the number of weevils that are uh, parasitized and where they are. Uh, so we can get a lot of useful background information, for example, uh, as to uh, how far down into the soil the nematodes can penetrate. So uh, for example, uh, they can actually move and parasitize uh, insects that are 50 centimeters down in the soil and 50 centimeters away from the uh, point where they've been located. Uh, but of more relevance uh, for the uh, applied purposes, uh, we also uh, use emergence traps. So these are erected over treated stumps and also some would be erected over untreated stumps. Uh, and so these catch the adult weevils that are coming out and these can be counted. And uh, inside the trap, so the weevils can't move away, they're caught in the trap and they're uh, caught in a little container inside that can be emptied at intervals. Uh, and so you can then compare the numbers in the uh, treated and untreated stumps. And so uh, we first did a number of small scale field trials, uh, which allows us to uh, look at various parameters, such as the different species of nematodes, um, time of application, uh, soil type, and so on. And this is Aoife Dillon, who was mentioned earlier. She did her PhD on this and then went to work for Quilche for a while. And uh, so uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, in these small scale field trials, the nematodes can parasitize the weevils developing the stumps and can reduce numbers of emerging weevils, uh, uh, adult weevils by up to 80%. And so the uh, best performing species that we had is Heterobditis downsi, a uh, native species you'll be glad to hear, and it could uh, uh, perform pretty well across a range of sites. Um, and so uh, then we moved into a uh, large scale field application. This was done uh, by Quilche uh, with uh, Aoife uh, running these trials. Uh, and uh, so uh, they used this rig, uh, which was developed by Forest Research in the UK. You saw a version of it um, in, in Roger's talk. Uh, so we've got this forwarder. Um, with a tank of water and a smaller tank with nematodes and the two are mixed and then uh, the nematodes are applied through these hoses with lances at the end uh, by these trained operatives who direct a jet of the uh, nematode suspension uh, around each stump. So it's not spread broadly over the site, but a directly uh, targeted application around the stumps and each stump takes half a litre uh, of water. 
Uh, so it needs lots of, lots of water, and that's one of the, uh, the drawbacks to the system. And also, as Roger mentioned, not every site is suitable for this forwarder, wet sites, steep sites, and so on. Uh, and uh, the nematodes uh, need to be carefully treated, although they, uh, the, the um, picture in the bottom right shows a pile of these little containers in which the nematodes were shipped. Uh, they have a limited shelf life, lim more restricted than that of chemicals, uh, and they have to be kept cool because uh, they are alive uh, and they can't be exposed to sunlight and so on. So there, there are a number of sort of operational uh, uh, challenges, if you like. Um, and uh, although it can re reduce the number of weevils, it's probably, this strategy is probably best for sites with intermediate levels of uh, weevil population. So too, if the population is too low, it's not worth the expense. They're also expensive, I didn't mention that. Uh, and if the population is too high, uh, you'll still have enough weevils coming out despite the treatment uh, that you still need to uh, protect your plants. Uh, and, uh, but one of the other uh, limitations is that if you're just treating one a clear fell in, in an isolated region, uh, it may be uh, uh, invaded by uh, weevils from untreated neighboring sites. Uh, and so it works best in a, where there's an area-wide coordinated strategy. And I believe this is what they're doing in uh, Natural Resources Wales, uh, where they, 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 there would be a kind of a, a policy to use these nematodes. So that's where uh, nematodes are at at the moment, not being used uh, in Ireland at the moment. So uh, the other uh, part of my talk is uh, the more recent work we've been doing on uh, forecasting of weevil populations. So as you are aware, uh, knowledge of insect uh, or of the pest population is very important in, uh, in IPM. Uh, and uh, so, uh, for example, the numbers, which we won't be dealing with here, uh, you can get that from your stump packing, but the timing of activity is what we're uh, focusing on. Um, now, uh, this is uh, part of the uh, illustration from the Chagas booklet uh, that you have, and it just uh, illustrates the, uh, the life cycle of the weevils. Uh, so uh, in the year after felling, uh, you're expecting to have the first wave of weevils emerging from stumps that have developed on site. So the eggs were laid uh, the previous spring or summer, and then uh, the weevils uh, developed in the stump, and then they're emerging uh, uh, onto the site in the autumn. Now, uh, they're, so they're going to emerge gradually over time. Uh, and as I mentioned, we were actually monitoring uh, these populations uh, in our field trials. And so we thought, well, if we have this data, uh, can we actually, could you actually forecast the time uh, at which uh, weevils will emerge? So in fact, uh, the, these are some of the, the data that we collected. Uh, so uh, different uh, cumulative emergence of weevils uh, over time at different sites in different years and different trials. And it varies from year to year and site to site. Now, the primary driver of that variation uh, is going to be temperature. Uh, because like uh, all insects, the rate of development of an insect is uh, driven by temperature. Uh, it's influenced by temperature. So uh, basically, the faster, uh, the hotter, the faster. Uh, and so in a warm year, you'd expect the weevils to come out earlier and so on. So uh, our question then is, can we forecast the time of weevil emergence for a specific site and year using the temperature that's experienced in the stump during preceding months? So in other words, it could be a forecasting tool. Now, uh, we uh, first, uh, to do this, there are a number of steps. Uh, these are the research steps, essentially, that we followed. Develop uh, a model linking emergence and temperature. Test the model uh, by comparing the model output with actual emergence in past field trials. And then we uh, did some of the steps that we'll take uh, into account as we go. Um, so now. Uh, we, there was a, a model already available which was developed uh, by forest research for a different purpose. So uh, it's been mentioned already that climate change is probably going to um, impact on the weevil life cycle, uh, reducing the number of years that it will take a particular weevil to uh, undergo its development. And so there was a, a model developed for this purpose to, uh, to figure out how many uh, years each generation would take. And this has been adapted uh, and uh, the resulting uh, model uh, or um, uh, uh, computer program is called Pine Ore. It's uh, written in the package Ore. Um, and uh, so we have, uh, we now have the model. We have the data from previous field trials uh, on weevil emergence. We have temperature data, historic temperature data from Met Aaron. 
uh, from there, uh, you can either use their nearest uh, station or the sort of gridded one kilometer grid uh, of temperatures. That is the kind of thing that allows us to uh, get the local uh, for the, 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 the temperatures, the forecast for Tullamore, for example, rather than uh, the nearest uh, Met station. So uh, we have this the, the temperature data that goes with the emergence. Do the two match? Can you use the model to predict or to backcast, as it were, what, uh, what should the weevil emergence have looked like uh, based on our model and then uh, compare it with the actual observed. And so here are two of the 27 sites uh, that we uh, did this with. Uh, in the case of the one on the left, uh, here we can see Deer Park. Uh, there's a very good match between the, uh, the real data that we collected in the emergence traps and the data, uh, the simulated uh, or predicted um, weevil emergence using the model and the temperature at the time uh, that these uh, weevils were developing. In the case of the, the site on the left, the match isn't so great, uh, Bally McShane boy, uh, that trial. Uh, so the next step then is to take into account various site factors um, that might affect uh, the rate of development. Uh, and then uh, get the uh, program to learn, as it were, uh, this is not my area at all. So uh, the, um, uh, the people develop developing this are in the audience, I'll mention them at the end. Uh, but uh, to use, now this random forest isn't a forest. It's not even a random forest. It's actually a computer program of some kind. It just happens to be called random forest. Uh, but it can be used to train the program to get a better match uh, between the simulated or uh, model generated and the actual. And so uh, the match improves for Ballymac Shane Boy. You can see the bottom right, much better match now. Uh, and then, so what side factors were important in getting this better match? Altitude, uh, so in, 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 in uh, order of importance, altitude, then slope, the steepness of the site, and the aspect, uh, whether it was facing north or south, etc. Now, all of these factors are going to uh, act. Now, they will have other effects on the actual weevil population. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, they're actually working by influencing the temperature. So a higher uh, a site at a higher altitude will be generally colder. If it's a north facing steep slope, uh, it's going to be colder as well. So they're all going to influence the temperature. Uh, soil type had the uh, least effect. Now the previous crop uh, was uh, uh, didn't not found to have a major effect in this process because it has already been taken into account. It is probably the most important factor in influencing the rate of development other than uh, uh, temperature. So weevils develop, uh, they, they like pine more than spruce, they like pine stumps more than spruce stumps, and they actually develop faster in them and at higher numbers. So that has a large effect on uh, development and it was already accounted for in the model. So in inputting the model uh, for a site, say whether it's pine or spruce. So the model, uh, is available. It's, this is a research. This is the stage of the research. It's just available or, or will be available uh, shortly um, for anyone else who wants to take it on and develop it uh, with adding perhaps a user friendly interface. Uh, there's a thing called, so this was written in OR, there's a thing called OR Shiny. Uh, so you get a shiny interface. In other words, something that uh, a normal person uh, would be able to, to use. And so input would be the site and then uh, it could uh, take uh, the temperature and tell you uh, what time you to expect your weevils. Um, possible future developments would be to uh, integrate uh, the results of your stump hacking. So in other words, uh, uh, can you improve the accuracy of your forecast uh, by a, a time of stump hacking you find uh, if they're all larvae, they're at one stage. If, uh, depending on the proportion of pupae, uh, that's a later stage, uh, the, the weevils are at a later stage of development, they're closer to emergence. Um, and uh, so, as I said, this uh, forecasting work uh, uh, has been done by, by Cahill Flood, uh, who's doing his master's on it, uh, he's down there, uh, and Alessandra, uh, who's uh, done the modeling as part of a PhD, uh, she's down there, uh, and uh, their supervisors uh, in the climatology and statistical areas, Raphael and Rowan. And now uh, the biocontrol, and they'll help me with any difficult questions. Um, so the, the, the biocontrol, uh, Aoife Dillon was mentioned previously. Uh, Louise did uh, uh, her PhD on pine weevil using nematodes and fungi uh, as combinations. Uh, poor, uh, now obviously, this, this research uh, on the, the biocontrol was a collaboration with Quilche. And uh, so we've uh, had a number of uh, Quilche 
people, including Porto Gotuma, who's just told us about CCF when he was in Quilche, and then uh, various uh, forest managers and uh, operatives who uh, uh, were involved in the project. Okay, thanks. Can I just ask, um, in relation to what Anne-Marie Dillon outlined earlier on, in re, you know, as in our ambition to reduce by 50%, how confident would you be that some of these measures that are being still at research stage, would that be fair to say, will bring us to where we need to be? I do the research. It's up to uh, those who want to take it uh, to to take it on. So the, the nematodes, I mean, they do work. Uh, they can be used. Uh, so it's a question of uh, will they be used and on what level of, of site? It would it would help reduce the pesticide use uh, and uh, the forecasting. Again, we we've done the research. We had the 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 available data and the model. Uh, so I think it's up to uh, people who are uh, uh, running forests to decide whether it would be useful to them. The question is, in, in relation to the nematodes, are there any side effects in relation to their use? OK, so they're applied in a targeted way around the stump. So obviously, uh, anything around the stump would be the most likely to be affected in the soil. So uh, as part of uh, a project, we looked at all the insects, the other insects, or the, well, the weevils or the, be the beetles uh, that might be living in or around the stump. And we looked at the numbers and the diversity, and uh, there was no effect of the uh, of the nematode application on either of those. Uh, then the question would next question would be, and how long are the nematodes going to stay around? And we've monitored their persistence. They'll stay around as long as there are weevils to infect because they can actually recycle. Once you apply them, they'll develop in the, the weevils that are there uh, and then the, the nematodes that come out of those will go on and infect more weevils. And so the, as long as there are weevils present in the stump, the nematodes will stay, but their population will gradually decline. Okay, the question is, are the nematodes target specific or will they affect other invertebrates as well? Um, in general, they're not target specific. Uh, the the Heterobitis downsi that I mentioned does like beetles a lot. Its natural host is probably a beetle. Uh, so that's why we looked to see, well, what else would they attack? Now, it's it's really, they, they may be able to kill whatever's there in large numbers, but there's not going to be a lot, let's say, in the stump uh, at a given time of, of any particular species. Uh, so, I mean, it's obviously an important factor to be aware of the potential non-target effects they can be used against other other species. OK, the question is um, in relation to the use of stump treatment using urea and the impact if nematodes are used as well on the same stump, is it? OK, the nematodes would be applied a good deal after uh, the urea is applied. And so uh, they would be applied at the time when the larvae are present. So we were applying them 18 months after felling. Now, we, ha we did think of uh, whether we also did some trials with with fungi applying fungi to the stumps which weren't great we thought of could you apply them at the time of felling you know at the time of the urea um application and um again they're, they're not great applied to stumps uh, roger mentioned you know using them against uh, fungi against adults is probably a better strategy now there is another potential um there's in 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 poland uh there's a fungus that colonizes stumps. So instead of using urea, they will actually, uh, they, and they've actually um, commercialized this, that they'll apply this fungus, uh, Flebiopsis gigantea, uh, to the stumps. It colonizes them and uh, by, it's a, bit, it's a bit like just making it unusable for uh, weevils as well as for the, um, the, the stump rot, the, the fomes. So it, it, that, but we don't have that particular species of fungus in Ireland. We did try another fungus that which might have the same effect, but um, again, wasn't, it wasn't at, at, at usable stage. Uh, it really, part, part of the, the reason for applying them in half a litre is that you need to get right around the stump uh, and it helps carry them into the soil. Uh, they're susceptible to, uh, let's say, ultraviolet light and so on. So if they get straight into the soil, it's better for them. Um, we reduced, I think, not the volume, but we did reduce the dose. Uh, we have the dose and they were still as effective, uh, but you, you wouldn't want to reduce the water too much. Now, there, there, actually, we did um, uh, in a, one of the, the trials, we um, applied them in, if you like, a, a dry formulation, which was actually infected insects, uh, but that's an expensive approach. So you could actually just drop 
your insects around a stump. I mean, there are a lot of ways you could try and take it. Uh, uh, there are um, uh, trial, uh, trials in, in uh, Europe uh, against a uh, corn root border where they have the nematodes in a little gel uh, that uh, from which the, the nematodes will emerge. So in other words, it's not in water. So when, when there, there are, there are, you know, there's lots of research that could be done on, on formulations, different formulations.